Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with a memorable baseball player, Frank Larry, who died recently at the age of 87. Frank Larry was the Yankee killer. He pitched most of his career for the Detroit Tigers, and he may have been the best pitcher in the American League in the late 1950s. Here's the Detroit Free Press on Frank Larry. Larry was the sixth of seven sons of a farmer and fiddle maker and grew up in a two-bedroom house in Northport, Alabama, just a few miles from Tuscaloosa, where he would later help lead the Alabama Crimson Tide to the College World Series his sophomore year. Signed by the Tigers in 1950, Larry toiled in the minors and served in the Army before joining Detroit in 1954. From 1955 to 1961, the two-time All-Star and 61 Gold Glove winner led the American League in wins, complete games, innings pitched, games started, and batters faced. Armed with a nasty slider, a curve, sinker, and fastball, the stocky right-hander first earned the nickname the Yankee Killer during a stretch from 1957 to 1959, in which he posted a 13-1 record against the Bronx Bombers. In 1958, he beat New York seven times, something no pitcher had done since 1916. Over the course of his career, Larry compiled a record of 28-13, and 13, against the Yankees. Tiger great Al Kaline said he really was a different pitcher against the Yankees. Frank had a strong slider and Mickey Mantle always had a tough time against him. Larry's greatest year was in 1961 when he posted a 23-9 record and a 3.24 ERA while finishing third in the Cy Young voting behind the Yankees' Whitey Ford and the Braves' Warren Spahn. Larry, who served up Roger Maris' homers number 31, 52, and 57 that season as the Yankee slugger surpassed Babe Ruth's single season home run record with 61, also provided heroics of his own in the Bronx. In the game at Yankee Stadium on May 12th, when I went into the stands to protect my dad from a fan, Frank won it with a home run in the top of the ninth inning, said Rocky Calavito. He really was the Yankee killer. They hated each other. That was a hell of a lineup he faced over those years, and the Yankees wanted to beat him so bad. The following season, when Sports Illustrated's annual baseball issue at the newsstands, it was Larry on the cover, not Maris. Sadly, Larry became one of the first victims of the infamous Sports Illustrated jinx. In the Tigers' home opener against New York, in 30-degree weather with rain and snow, Larry pulled a muscle in his leg while running out a triple in the bottom of the seventh inning that drove home the tying run. He was never the same pitcher. After altering his arm motion to compensate for his ailing leg, Larry experienced a series of arm problems that eventually led to the end of his career three years later. Larry, who often played guitar singing country songs, may have been channeling some century-old Civil War sentiments when he quipped to a Detroit writer, me being a Southern boy, I never thought Yankees was too smart. His teammate Paul Foytek said he was such a good man and had a wonderful sense of humor. I remember once in a pregame meeting, we were talking about a certain hitter that we didn't want to beat us. Someone said, we should just walk him. Frank said, hell, why don't we just hit him? Yeah, that was Frank Larry. He was quite a character. Every once in a while, he'd just take the team bus for a joyride. They don't make him like Frank Larry anymore in baseball. Well, we're going to move on to our feature. And to introduce that feature, let's play a little What's My Line. Dorothy Kilgallen. Are you in the motion picture business? No, honey, I'm not. That's one down to nine to go, Mr. Sir. Have you ever appeared as a star of a nightclub or hotel room entertainment? Yes, sugar, I sure have. Miss Frankie? Are you a singer? Yes, ma'am. Have you appeared on television? Oh, yes, sugar. Were you part of an act at one time? What do y'all mean by that, sweetie? Did you record and work in cafes with someone else? Yes. I tell you, I, it's the voice, really. That's Jerry Smith. Jerry Smith is right. She didn't disguise the voice that much. I, it was... But I thought Kitty did a good job, though. You had him spinning there. Well, oh, I just can't talk any other way but this. Thank you. Very nice of you to come and visit us. I again. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so and you right sing up a storm. Sing yeah. up a storm is absolutely right. And thank you for being nice enough to give us a warm and sunny few months. Well, our feature tonight is Kiwi Smith, who died recently at the age of 89, and she could sing up a storm, whether it was with her husband, Louis Prima, or on her own. She was a nice girl from Norfolk, Virginia, with a great voice. When she was 18, she met Louis Prima in Atlantic City. They got married at 21, and their act became the Toast of Las Vegas in the 1950s. They were Sonny and Cher before Sonny and Cher, except both of them were way more talented. Louis was the wild man, always jumping around, and Keely would just stand there with a deadpan look, and then she'd interrupt him with that beautiful voice. They had a huge hit with that old black magic, probably as good a version as there is. The old black magic has me in a spell. Old black magic, that you, we so well. I'm the fingers up and down my spine. Sing which rap when you're on me. 
They also did the classic version of I Ain't Got No Body with Louis really hammering up for that one. <laughs> Now, to Louis' credit, he knew what he had and he knew when to feature her. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about me and they were also big on ed sullivan ed loved him my favorite was the time that louie was dancing and hopping around the stage Keely was just watching him like she always would, and all of a sudden he called on her, and she started hopping around the stage even wilder than him. Her other act, by the way, was the great saxophonist Sam Butera and their backup band, The Witnesses. Louis Prima, Sam Butera, and The Witnesses, and Keely Smith. When they were together, Louis Prima took most of the attention, but everybody realized that Keeley Smith was a singer-singer, and one of the ones who appreciated the most was Frank Sinatra, who had them on his show in the late 1950s and featured Keeley in a solo. What's the matter? Don't you like working with my wife? I love working with Keeley. She's loaded with talent. Good. And from now on, no more that solo flying job. Okay. In fact, why don't the three of us do a number? Um, it's all right with me. How about you, Keeley? Who needs them? What are you and me? What are we going to do? We? You and me. Oh, please. I work alone. Don't interrupt the Keeler Smith show. When day's done and shadows fall, I dream of you. When day's done, I think of all the joy. We knew. Louis liked to play around and it sort of wrecked their marriage in the early 60s and they broke up. And for a while, Keely was on her own, and she wasn't used to it. She'd never been on her own before. Here she talks about it. The best person that I ever worked with that could just completely relax you, because I was never used to talking. And for me to do a skit on television was a little difficult. Give me a song, let me stand up and sing, and I'm okay. But Donna Shore, when Louie and I divorced, Donna Shore was the first one that got me to come out of the house, because I, I was petrified to come out by myself. And she had me do her show, and she was so wonderful that I completely relaxed on it, even though for the first time I was by myself, I didn't have Louie. It didn't take long for Keely to get used to it and become one of the great singers of our generation on her own. Swing, 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 swing. Everybody start to swing. Da -da -da. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now you're singing with a swing. Swing, 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 swing. Everybody start to swing. Da -da -da. By the way, in 1964, Keeley was one of the first persons to recognize Lennon and McCartney as songwriters. She might have been the first person to do a Lennon and McCartney songbook. You'll never know how much I really love you. You'll never know how much I really care. Listen. Do you want to know a secret? Do you promise not to tell? Oh. Let's do a couple more Keeley solos. Here she is singing Jerome Kerr. You are the promised kiss of springtime that makes the lonely winter and 
for good measure, Keely doing a little Gershwin. The way you wear your hair, the way you sip your tea, the memory of all the As I said, a singer, singer. She had a good career even after Louis died. Her boyfriends included A.J. Foyt and Clint Eastwood for a while. And for nearly six decades, there was no better lounge singer than Kiwi Smith. Well, we're going to close tonight with Martin Ransohoff, who died recently at the age of 90. He was a producer in television and in movies. Most of the obits talked about his, quote, lowbrow comedies like Green Acres and Beverly Hillbillies. But there were a lot of people responsible for those. His biggest impact was in films. And I want to mention two films especially. The first is the underrated movie you don't see much anymore, the 1965 The Cincinnati Kid, featuring the greatest poker scene in movie history. You got Steve McQueen, who might have been the biggest box office draw in the world at the time, facing off against Edward G. Robinson, who was older, and was probably the best actor never to win an Academy Award. That's a travesty. And look at the side players in that scene. You've got Joan Blondell doing the dealing. You've got Carl Malden. You've got Anne Margaret at her sexiest. In fact, Tuesday Weld was in this movie. And it's one of the only movies you can say that Tuesday Weld wasn't the sexiest woman in the movie. And you've got Rip Torn. It's a wonderful movie and a wonderful scene. Steve McQueen has aces and tens showing and an ace in the hole. And Edward G. Robinson has eight, nine, ten queen of diamonds. And in the hole, no one knows what his card is, but when he turns it over, it turns out to be the Jack of Diamonds. Here's that scene. Call you a thousand and raise what I've got in front of me. Thirty-five hundred. That ace must have helped you, kid. Call you thirty-five hundred and I'll raise you uh, five thousand. Oh, good, he's got the Jack. Couldn't have the Jack. He didn't have Queens. He's got the Jack of Diamonds. No, he's trying to buy it. Nancy's bluffing him. Sure he is. He hasn't got the Jack. The kid's got him. Yeah, the kid's got him. The kid's got him. You're right. The kid's got him. I got him. I got the man. Five thousand to you, kid. I'll take your marker, kid. I can get the money. I know you can. It was it. That's five thousand you owe me, kid. You still playing, kid? No, I'm through. You raised some tens on the lousy three flush. Gets down to what it's all about, doesn't it? <laughs> Making the wrong move at the right time. Is that what it's all about? <laughs> Like life, I guess. You're good, kid. But as long as I'm around, you're second best. You might as well learn to live with it. Yeah, you don't get much better than that. Kid goes off, and he loses at pitching quarters against a shoeshine boy amidst the strain of a Ray Charles blues song. It's another movie recommendation from Remembering the Past. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And as a final tribute to Martin Ranselhoff, we're going to use a song from the movie he said that was his favorite, We've talked about this movie before because James Garner also said it was his favorite, and we talked about it in the James Garner podcast. It's the 1964 Patty Shayefsky drama, The Americanization of Emily. There's a wonderful song in the movie about Emily, the character played by Julie Andrews, music by Johnny Mandel, lyrics by Johnny Mercer, and you can't get any better than that. There are a lot of good versions of this song, but let's go with the version by the guy who wanted a spot on the Keely Smith show, Old Blue Eyes along with a beautiful arrangement by Nelson Riddle, and you can't get any better than that either. Emily, Emily, Emily As the murmuring sound of May All silver bells, coral shells, carousel And the laughter of children at play